Thank you very much. And uh, I wanted to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate in this conversation. So uh, it's probably no surprise I'm going to talk about art. Um, what I may do, however, is offer an opportunity to consider especially relevant approaches to the production experience and nature of contemporary art as we prepare for Canada's 150th anniversary. I'm just going to try and get this slide. And it was great uh, this morning to hear a bit about the memories of Expo 67. Um, we have a watershed moment in Canada's identity um, with Expo. This World Fair in Montreal has been so celebrated that perhaps to try and simply replicate it or emu emulate it is misguided. The nature of not only art, but ideas of progress and nationhood have changed substantially, and I propose that we might consider alternative yet equally engaging approaches to celebrate our culture. We must look to artists for ideas that successfully incorporate our past, our present, and our futures. Let us take inspiration from artists. Let us ask artists to create new work and to develop new ideas. Rather than uh, perhaps a large scale event, we can imagine a network of moments sprinkled across the country. Expo 67 reveled in monuments to form through architecture. It debuted what has arguably become Canada's iconic architecture, Habitat, by the great ar architect Moshe Safdie. Habitat modifies the single fam family dwelling to exist concisely and effortlessly in the high density city and is today still recognized as groundbreaking and celebrated design. Acknowledging Habitat's iconic status and generative form, artist Tyler Brett, who is based in Bruno, Saskatchewan, population 600, takes inspiration from the past in proposing new possibilities. And this is an inkjet drawing that he's created, and you'll see on the top band uh, is, is actually a rendering of the Habitat in Montreal. And below is his modest proposal in which he proposes a retro-futuristic reworking of habitat covered in nature. Brett states, as for post safty habitat, I'm offering Moshe a life preserver by refurbishing habitat with a seawall barrier extension. To understand exactly what he means with this is per not, perhaps not the point. Um, he wishes to protect against future environmental impact the spaces and gaps between the cubic units that have been backfilled and held together by an undulating carpet of green organic matter. It is a proactive sentiment designed to elaborate on Expo 67's themes of man and his world, but of course is not necessarily, or pro, you know, really isn't meant to be taken literally. It's playful. Um, it imagines perhaps uh, a future of environmental catastrophe. Um, and we're not even sure, is he protecting that history or is he covering that history? But my point in showing this artwork is that artists can provoke such unexpected and unique um, ways of seeing the world and new ideas that this is just one example, not, not even necessarily meant to be realized as an actual artwork, but as a form of research and communication. Um, and there's just a detail. And I have the landing pad, Jean-Pierre, nice. it, it still exists. Um, I was really pleased you foreshadowed this. Um, <laughs> That's, that's the landing pad. It's in St. Paul, Alberta, as we heard, and it still does exist. It was built as part of Canada's centennial celebrations. Recently, however, a Montreal artist, Jacqueline Huang Engyen, considers the small town of St. Paul, Alberta, and its main contribution to centennial celebrations in the form of the landing pad. 
Jacqueline writes, the aim uh, with this construction was to symbolically welcome intergalactic beings and the whole world to Canada, thus promoting an image of hospitality, tolerance, and diversity. And it truly is a wonderful thing. It does all those things. Um, but she's done a lot of research into it, and she's created an exhibition that features photographs and film and historical artifacts uh, around the landing pad and its history and site. And she writes, encapsulating the very spirit of Canadian politics at the time with an unconditional sense of hospitality, the pad functions as an allegorical form of utopian embodiment, coinciding with a radical shift in Canadian immigration politics at the time. And it was created at the time when Canada's immigration laws were uh, liberalized and opened the doors to new immigrants. So it, it's, um, um, the UFO landing pad is used in Jacqueline's work to address ideological issues around the formation of multiculturalism and readings of the wor word alien and what it means to be alien. Her artwork called 1967, A People Kind of Place, playfully, creatively, and critically ties within an ongoing artistic investigation into the relations of politics, history, and knowledge production and explore, explores through archival research a unique view of a moment in Canadian history, which is distinct from perhaps a documentary film, which might otherwise present the information in a different way. Like Tyler Brett previously in his revisited Habitat, Jacqueline explores the past with a sense of playful but critical subjectivity to propose new opportunities both artists work with historical and material culture and explore utopian possibilities that open up new understandings of the present and ask us who we are as a country in the present. Rather than a strictly romantic longing for the past or a purely imaginary or imagining of the future, artists may create works that bring together past, present, and future and cut across stereotypical notions of monument as simply a static marker of the past or a purely imaginary future. And um, Jacqueline um, acknowledges uh, in her writing the work of Ken Lum, Vancouver artist. And this is Ken Lum's a uh, monument for East Vancouver, which was built as part of the Olympic celebrations in 2010. Um, it's developed from a graffiti symbol that has circulated for several decades in East Vancouver. It is a symbol that has circulated in what he calls provisional terms. Um, like Brett and Eng Yen, Lum engages with popular or vernacular imaginaries to create a world a work that relates to diverse communities. He states about this work, my idea was to formalize the symbol through scale and permanence. Although its precise origins are not known, the symbol does date back to at least the 1940s, according to the memory of senior citizens with whom he spoke, which is the beginning of the post-Second World War period. Its roots may be linked to the Catholic inscription of East Vancouver culture at the time, home as it was to many Italians, Greeks, and Eastern Europeans. Over the years, the symbol has been adopted as an emblem for East Vancouver as a whole, as a whole but its appearance has generally been uh, rather tentative rather than overt. He continues, the lack of overtness is, I feel, symptomatic of the underlying meanings that the symbol expresses. The meanings have to do with problems of injustice, inequality, subjugation, and the trauma of poverty and acculturation, particularly as it relates to immigrant life. His proposal is for a site uh, in East Vancouver that is, he calls visually uh, messy or peripheral, um, but this East Vancouver symbol is rendered as a 57-foot tall sculpture that lights up after dark. The word East Van encircled by a cross delineation that uh, floats on its own. It seems to float on its own. And the sculpture faces west towards downtown, towards the center, and is an expression of both hope and defiance. So 
So through my work uh, with artists at Plugin, we have created countless projects that seek to create alternative narratives to mainstream or accepted notions of memory, identity, and the status quo. We engage multiple perspectives and seek to provide compelling new ideas that provoke thought. We engage youth in imagining alternative possibilities. What is compelling about working with living artists and creating new works is that we can create moments in everyday life that add value to our experiences of the world. And when you encounter works like this, um, it, it's engaged not simply as a symbol, but as an experiential moment, as something that's happening to you in real life. And it's like walking into a novel or walking into a film yourself. Uh, suddenly, you have perhaps new perceptions of the world around you. As we th proceed through space, new perceptions and opportunities unfold in our everyday lives. So I'd just like to quickly share with you an example of a project that I uh, organized. Um, and this is by an artist named Dan Graham. It's called Performance Cafe with Perforated Sides. Um, it's a basically a, what the artist calls a pavilion. It's neither a sculpture nor a building. It's something in between. Um, it's an opportunity for engaging with experience. And as you can see, perhaps it's built, um, the two long sides are built with a perforated stainless steel, so it's semi-transparent. And the holes in the steel are of different sizes, so it creates a kind of um, optical effect, which we call a moiré pattern, which is a kind of optical interference. And it really, um, like a film or an animation, it quickly changes your perception and makes you aware of your surroundings. The two ends um, uh, of the pavilion are created with a two-way mirror glass. So you see a reflection of both yourself and whoever you're with, you're partly looking through the glass and partly seeing yourself. This was originally organized as part of Toronto's Nuit Blanche um, activities in 2010. And I'm very pleased that the artist has donated it to Plugin. And today, as we speak, we're in the process of uh, installing it on our roof, um, which is at the Bueller Center, our building, which we share with the University of Winnipeg. Um, finally, I want to uh, present an, an anti-monumental monument by First Nations artist Jimmy Durham. Durham is an artist of Cherokee descent uh, who lives in a self-imposed exile in Europe. Uh, with the construction of Plugin's new facility, Durham gifted Plugin Canada's first um, pole to mark the center of the world to be on display indefinitely. And it's uh, located in our entrance foyer. The pole acts as, it's, it's meant to be humorous. Uh, it acts as a tongue-in-cheek marker of place and identity. And there will be seven poles on seven continents. But by placing this pole wherever you happen to be, you become immediately at the center of the world. Alternately playful and empowering, the pole questions received ideas of permanence, importance, power, and identity. In our poll, you can see midway up, um, there's, a, there's a mirror affixed so that the viewer may frame themselves uh, within a new conception of time and place. They, suddenly, you can see your, not only yourself, but that you are, um, at least for a moment, the center of the world. Um, in summary, I would like to urge all of us to seek inspiration for Canada's 150th anniversary from artists. I, think, I hope that these are just a few examples to show you of the truly um, creative and imaginative ways which we may have not even thought of to begin thinking about ourselves and our communities. Let us foster with artists the opportunities to create works that challenge preconceived notions of identity and history. Let us challenge ourselves by creating opportunities for art in everyday life, in the public and in shared spaces of our towns, cities, and elsewhere. Let us create opportunities for wonder 
and discovery as we pass through our communities and lives and create artworks that are responsive, dynamic, and yes, playful. Let us provide artists with the means to create new works and consequently, because art is information, to create new ideas. Thank you.